one of the things I really try to focus is on what our students can do, not what they shouldn't do. And it's not that we shouldn't have boundaries. I think boundaries are very important. But a lot of times when we tell our students what not to do, it puts negative ideas in their heads. And I'll give you an example of this. And I actually shared this in the podcast, but just to something to think about. Here's what I want you to do. Don't think about an elephant. What did you just think of? What was the first thing that came to your mind? Was it a giraffe? <laughs> probably not. It's probably an elephant. And so a lot of times what we do when we focus on the things our students shouldn't do, and obviously, and, and honestly, what we shouldn't do, we actually put bad ideas into our heads. And I've had a lot of interactions with this over my years. And I'm not a big fan of like anti-bullying things because we are focused on don't bully. And I want you to really think what would be the best result of that if we really stop bullying? So our wish is please don't be horrible people. It seems like a pretty low bar. So I try to focus on leadership. How do we actually teach our kids to elevate, to lift people up, to bring them to a better place, not just don't be horrible? I think that's such a low bar. So I really love this conversation with Jason Schaefer. And Jason and I have gone back uh, over the years. I met him a long time ago, and I was so impressed with the work that he was doing in his school on helping students create a really positive digital footprint. And this is becoming more and more important in our time today. It, it was honestly important years ago. I remember reading an article, I think it was in 2010, maybe 2011, and it said within 10 years, your online presence will replace your resume. Now, I know people still use resumes, but our online presence is more and more important than ever. And are we helping our students? Are students losing opportunities, not only because they're doing negative things online, but maybe because they're doing nothing online, that you can't find them. And if we know people are looking, how do we actually put them in a space where when they find them, they're in a place of advantage, that they actually lead to more opportunities than focusing on what they might lose? That's what I loved about this podcast. Jason has a new book called Brand Up. We talk about it. And I think there's so much value in what Jason had to share today. I loved his podcast. If you know anything about me, my work, you know his views align a lot with mine on what we can help our students to really figure out to create wonderful opportunities. You're gonna love this podcast. I love talking to Jason. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed today to have Jason Schaefer. Uh, he is actually an educator, literally about 30 minutes from my house. I didn't know that until we jumped on the podcast. I knew he was in Florida because we actually met there several years ago. Yeah. Uh, I met Jason uh, and a bunch of other absolutely amazing teachers. I actually very vividly remember that day. Uh, I think I remember it because I was still living in Canada and I almost died of heat <laughs> so that's maybe partly why i remember it but yeah. i remember actually sitting with your staff and the faculty i actually remember it was like leveled yep i i remember that right i remember and uh they were so wonderfully uh kind and gracious and jason and i started talking that day and he was sharing some of the stuff that i was talking about that he was already doing and i i really appreciated that and they basically had this program in the school i'll, I'll let jason talk more about that but he, he's been just doing incredible things forever. So I met some really amazing people that day. And you're one of the ones that stuck out. So when you, you when you actually messaged me that you had this book coming out, uh, and you can actually see Jason has a new book out um, with Stacey Ross Cohen, and it's called Brand Up. You can actually see in the link down below. I think it is such a, I, I said, hey, you got to come on a podcast. Once it's out, watching the podcast, I want you talking about this. So Jason, if you could just kind of introduce yourself what you do today, how you got there. I think that is a really great place to start. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me, George. Uh, so this journey started back in 2013. Um, I was asked to reimagine our digital uh, communications course and our computer applications course. And the vision was kind of fuzzy. We just knew that we didn't know what we wanted to do because we didn't know what the future would look like for these children, right? And so the benefit of me not being an ed tech guy at that time was that I wasn't coming in with a particular bias or a particular app that I loved. Mm -hmm. I was coming in almost the same way the kids were coming in. I was a, a newbie. I was fresh. 
I didn't know much about um, Instagram, social media, Twitter, those kinds of things. And so I was willing to learn from the ground. And so what that meant was I'm going to study everything I can about personal branding, everything mm -hmm. I can about marketing. And that led me in some amazing places. And then I would find ways to sort of connect that to teaching computer literacy and digital citizenship. At the beginning, it was a lot of common sense media, what not to do. Mm -hmm. And then as I grew and felt more comfortable, it went from this father, like, here's what you don't do right. to this big brother, like, Hey, here's what you can do so that you can still have fun and still do all the things you love, but it won't destroy your reputation. It'll help it. Um, so that was 2013. I think we met 2017 yeah. and then 2019 uh, is when I decided to come up here to Orlando and today I'm doing entrepreneurship stuff, but mm -hmm. I kept the relationship with uh, my friend Stacy, who uh, was a Huffington Post author, and mm -hmm. we collaborated on this book together. And it's got a great mix of her experience on Madison Avenue and my experience in the classroom. And there's tangible, actual things that uh, students and young adults can really benefit from. Well, it's actually interesting because the the book talks about ways that you can and I, I really believe in that we are so focused on don't do this and I'll, i'm going to give everyone a little little mind game here right we focus on telling kids to don't do stuff so much in schools i remember i was speaking to a group of edgy or students and they introduced me and they, the guy didn't know who i was by the way it was like kind of weird because i'm like why would you bring me in to speak but they just saw hey we got to talk about social media with our students so they said Hey, here's this guy from Canada. He's going to talk about social media with you today. So it was all high school students. The second they, he said that, they all started groaning. Because they thought you were going to tell the bad stuff. Because all they thought I was going to do for the next hour was like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And all I said to them was, hey, do you all know what cyberbullying is? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, don't do that. Anyways, here are the things you can do. Here are some of the students right now doing some incredible things. And many of them came up to me and said, no adult has ever talked to us like this, that they ever said, here's the things you can do. And here's a little thought experiment, right? A lot of times when we say don't, you actually put ideas in the heads that are negative. So here's the experiment. Jason, let's see if the, how this works with you. So don't think of an elephant. <laughs> like elephant. what's the first thing you think of? The elephant. Right. Yeah. right. And, that, and that's, you know, I remember someone saying that to me. I was like, ah, that's kind of weird. And, and really, if people are going to search you to make sure you're not doing something bad, what happens when they find that you're doing really great stuff? It's just going to be to your right. advantage, right? So my first week of school at my new school here, we brought in like a FBI agent and he was going to give the social media talk. Right. Oh, okay. And it was, don't do this, don't do this. Here's right. a kid who got uh, stolen right. from a park. I walked into my principal's office and I said, I know we just met. You just hired me this is my thing. And if that's the only message we're going to give our kids, right. I don't know if I found the right place. Hmm. And she said, Jason, what do you, what's your thing? And I explained to her where I come from and my approach. She said, I'm going to give you opportunity to speak to the parents in a couple of weeks. We set up a coffee talk. I had about, you know, 40 or 50 of the parents who decided to show up. And I said, Hey, listen, your kids heard this message. I want you to know that there's an alternative message. Both are about your child's safety but one is realizing that your kids are not giving up their accounts because that guy told them to. Right. Uh, if anything, they're going to see what they can get away with. Um, if you teach your kids to love themselves and you mm -hmm. show them good etiquette, they're going to copy what they see and what's in the best interests of themselves. That doesn't mean they're not going to make a mistake now. And right. then. Um, but if we raise good people, good humans, we're going to get good results. If you, give them these tools and you never show them what to do with them other than telling them what not to do, then you're leaving them open to guessing right. and it's not fair. It's not fair to them. Yeah. And that, that like the reality of it is everyone makes mistakes. And I think that building social capital and actually doing positive stuff, when you do make a mistake, people are like, okay, is that really, is that really who this person is? And I think that's something that's really important. The, the interesting thing when we were kind of prepping for the show, um, you talk about students and really how they put themselves out there, sharing what they do online, creating opportunities for themselves. You actually met Stacy, uh, the you know the lead author on this book, through your presence online and through you being. Can you actually tell everyone about that story? How how you how you two first connected? Yeah, so it's cool 
and it's also an example of how little I knew and thought I needed to prove to myself mm. and to my kids, right? So again, I was a social studies teacher. I was a soccer coach. Here I was given this opportunity to teach this new class that I felt totally unprepared for. So I felt as if I needed to prove not only to them, but to me that the stuff I was telling them, hey, if you go on Twitter and you connect with an expert in the field you're interested on, they'll write you back and you can form a friendship. And right. I, I said it and I believed it, but I couldn't prove it, right? And so I started to do those things. And so here's what happened. So Stacy had two high school age daughters. She was helping them get into college and she realized there was a need for them to be working on their personal brand, their social media. So in her own personal research, she found the work we were doing at my old school at North Broward. And in her article, which was about three or four pages, there was one sentence that said, there's a school that does this in Coconut Creek, Florida. Mm -hmm. My buddy, my department head at the time, Keith Lindsley, he sees this article, how he sees it, I have no idea, forwards it to me. Two months later, I finally open the email and I see this and I'm like, wait a minute, this is my chance. So I go to Twitter, I find her, I, e I DM her and I say, hey, my name is Jason. I know you don't know me, but in your article that you wrote in the Huffington Post about personal branding, you mentioned a class in South Florida. I created that class. Hmm. And I figured, hey, why not see if she wants to talk more? So if you'd like to talk more about it, we should connect. And I just left it there thinking, all I'm doing is showing my kids that it's okay to reach out to someone. Maybe she'll write me back. Who knows? Well, within an hour, I'm getting a Facebook message, a LinkedIn message, a Twitter message. And then some lady calls my school looking for me. I find out it's her. I get home later that night. We connect on the phone for about an hour. And at the end, I'm like, I'm just going to go for it. And I say, listen, if you're ever in Florida, it would be awesome if you could come visit me at my class. And she says, I'll be there next week. <laughs> so without asking permission, I invite her to my classroom. I then, you know, ask for forgiveness the next day. But of course, my school right. was really excited to have her. We met that day back in 2015. She ended up interviewing my students, college advising, admissions about why are you doing this class? What's the value? And I guess she was skeptical herself even like, is this a one-off? Is this guy just like a rogue teacher? But, right. she's, but she saw that this is a requirement for graduation. Everyone in the school supports it. The feedback was really positive. So she went home. She wrote a second article for HuffPost. It was uh, completely flattering. And we became friends. Um, we had a vision to almost create like a consultant company. It didn't work right. out. But we knew it would not, we knew there was something there. We didn't know what it was. About two years ago in the middle of COVID, I reached out to her and said, hey, I haven't spoken to you in a couple of months. How are you? She said, I cannot believe your timing. I'm just about to sit down on this book. I need you to help me. And so we collaborated and hmm. she, she brings in, like I said earlier, that professional Madison Avenue, what I was trying to learn from so that I could emulate it with my kids. And I'm bringing the result of that emulation and the experiences that I had with my students uh, in the book. And it's a, it's a really cool class. I'm not saying it because I wrote it. It's, it's a really cool collaboration. Well, yeah. It, one of my favorite, I think it's Steven Johnson and maybe I'm misquoting, but uh, I love this quote that chance favors the connected mind that the more connected you are, the more likely those things start happening. And, you know, you putting yourself out there, sharing that Stacey finding you, and you know leads to an interaction you got to put yourself out there then leads to a, a book that is absolutely awesome and that's something that you know i've seen happen with students we had a student who wrote about how a book that inspired her um shared it on our community blog and within about three four hours it was actually peter reynolds he wow. commented to the the young lady we never reached out to him but i think he had like a google alert maybe for his name actually no somebody we knew had reached saw the quote said, I actually know Peter Reynolds, so I'm gonna tell him to comment. And so commented, totally changed that girl's perspective. And one of the things that I always say is in that moment when the author comments to this young lady in her class, what does she learn? Not only does her voice matter, it can reach anyone in the, in the world. And that's a really powerful thing to teach your students. And I absolutely love that. I, I wanna go back to something that you mentioned because this really was what struck me. Uh, I think it was your, and forgive the Canadian, right? It was your grade nine, your freshman class. Yep. 
they started the that process of like building their footprints, but it was also a graduation requirement for your yeah. school. Mm-hmm. And can you like talk about that? Because I think that is very essential. Um, to like how how did that like what did that class look like? Why did you think it was so crucial? And I know that's not your call at the time, but it obviously wasn't. your your administrators were very behind that. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so there's the short answer, and that was the college essay. Right. And then there was the long answer of our kids are messing up every t- chance we take. They're sending inappropriate text messages. They're doing inappropriate things on social media. Mm. And nobody at that time really pinpointed the solution, right? Nobody mm. really figured out how do we stop this? And for me, I mean, again, I don't take credit for anything. Everything I know I learned from – from others. And what I was figuring out was that maybe they're messing up because they don't know who they are. And a lot of that comes from Simon Sinek. Um, So essentially what the school was trying to do was we needed to teach computer applications. It was already a requirement, but we wouldn't want to teach PowerPoint and Word documents. We wanted to do something cutting edge. Uh, We were an Apple distinguished school uh, or we were trying to be at that time. And so we knew we needed to step up our game. And so the idea for personal branding really comes from the digital portfolio piece. Mm -hmm. Um, The digital portfolio being the in-house personal. And then when you're ready to share social media could be that external digital portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, like, although I had experience in e-portfolios, I didn't have experience in all the other stuff. And so I was looking at uh, Sir Ken Robinson. I was looking at Simon Sinek. I was looking at George Kuros and what are they doing out there um, that I can bring into the classroom. So to give you the really short version, it was a 12, 13 week course. The first five weeks, we don't talk about computers at all. It's about them. And Mm -hmm. I use the golden circle from Simon Sinek. What do you do? How do you do it? And why do you do it? And if you could write that why statement, it's kind of like a business writing its mission statement. And if you write your mission statement, then you're going to do everything in your power to stay true to it because your shareholders, your customers are going to expect you to live up to it. And so that's what I was asking my kids to do. And 80% of them were not prepared to do that, right? Mm -hmm. These are 15-year-old kids doing stuff that major corporations are are struggling to do. Mm -hmm. But I challenged them to do it anyway. And we watched Simon Sinek and we watched some Vander Holyfield pump up videos about beating Mike Tyson and stuff like that. But the bottom line came with, if they're going to be able to write an effective college essay, if they're going to be able to sit in an interview, if they're going to be able to choose the college that's right for them, not just their favorite football team, how could they possibly make those choices if they don't know who they are? Now, inadvertently, that's also going to manage how you act online, right? right? So let me show you what Twitter is now that you know who you are. I feel comfortable in my class allowing you time to find people that you want to connect with. Um, Let's write a blog. Let's create a YouTube channel. Mm. Whereas almost every school at this time is doing everything they can to get their kids off of these. Let's ban cell phones. Let's add GPT. Unbelievable, right? Right Right away. So my kids are walking around school with their cell phones, recording things and posting. And any other school would have been putting them in detention. Mm. Um, the hardest piece was the buy-in from the parents, obviously, because we were going to promote the use of social media in right. a world that they were hearing social media is killing, uh, environments. Yep. And, uh, but we proved to them and George, here's how I knew it was working. Parent teacher conference nights. Um, we used to sit in the cafeteria and every teacher was in the same room and every parent that came to my table, all I, I didn't say a word. I just showed them the things mm. their kids created. Right. And I'm going to say it was a 40% chance they were going to cry because they didn't know these things about their own children. Right. I was getting hugs. I was getting uh, tears. I didn't have ever anyone yelling at me or nobody cared about grades. Mm. It was, thank you for telling me something about my kid. Thank you for caring about their story. I didn't know my child wanted to be an architect. I wouldn't have known that unless I came here tonight and spoke to you and, and I didn't even tell them. I just showed them what their kids were willing to share with me, but they weren't even willing to share with their own mm-hmm. parents sometimes. Um, when that started happening and it was happening consistently year after year, 
I, I knew I was up to something special and, right. um, and this book now just gives me an opportunity to share that with more people. Well, they, when you're talking about this, I was, I was thinking about this, this idea, because you talked about the, you first started like internally people like kind of figure out who they are. And then as they kind of decided, you know, who they were and really understood, I, I guess they didn't decide who they were. They understood who yeah. they were. Right. They started using external stuff. Right. And a lot of schools are like, Oh, we, we already do like seesaw or fresh grade or Google this or that. Right. I'm like, you're, you're creating two different worlds. You're having your school world where kids are going to act a certain way because they know teachers are basically in those spaces. But then they actually go on to what the world uses and then they act a certain way because they, they see them as two separate spaces. Yeah. And I don't know, and I don't know if you have seen this, but I, I've, I struggled because I, I still work with students quite a bit talking about this stuff. You know, I get to travel and, and I remember distinctly this one basically saying the student was like, I want to post positive stuff. I want to share good things that I'm doing, but I'm so terrified that I am going to be ostracized for being positive. That I was almost, if you're going to share, you know, if you're going to have your Instagram, your burner accounts, post crappy stuff, that's okay. And that's the culture that, cause they're, cause they're kids and they learn from each other because a lot of adults haven't stepped in that to a point when someone, they would almost get like teased yeah. for doing the good stuff. And that's why I'm like a big advocate If we have to, like, I don't know if you've seen that or that's yeah. a, that's an issue. That's why I'm a big advocate. You have to step in early because it's kind of like Lord of the flies. We're just throwing a bunch of kids on the Island and just like hoping piggy doesn't die. <laughs> right. And so like, that's, that's the reality is that who, like, how are we leading our kids from, you know, levels of maturity, having some understanding of this, because if you just let me do this with my friends, I'm going to be honest with you, it would have been fart videos on TikTok for yeah. like, like how long can I, can I do the full 15 seconds before? Oh, it's got 60. Let's see what I can do now. Right. That's all I would have done. Right. George, the first day of class, I made them college admissions officers first day. Hmm. And I gave them at first two sample students. I said from the beginning, they have the same grades. They are right. both good kids. They don't get in trouble. Here's some copies of this kid's Facebook stuff that I found, LinkedIn stuff that I found, Twitter stuff that I found. Here's the other kids. And they mm. dissected it and they found the one they loved. And I had them vote. All right, who we're giving the scholarship to? Right. And they vote and it's all intense. And then I say, oh, I forgot to tell you. There's two more kids. And the reason I forgot to tell you is because one of them I Googled and there's nothing out there. I can't find right. anything about them. And the other one I Googled and they don't exist. They're a ghost. Does anybody want to change their vote? Never once in seven mm -hmm. years teaching three semesters in a row, six periods a day, did anyone ever switch from that person they were passionate about to someone they didn't know anything about or someone they thought was hiding on the internet. Right. And that setup allowed me moving forward to say, hey, listen, guys, you fell in love with this kid for this reason. That's what college admissions officers are doing. Right. So you can post the fart video, but then you're going to have to hide it and create right. it on your Finsta. Unless and, you become a fart. Unless you're too perfect or something like that. And you're going to create this environment. Like entrepreneur. Right. Like Jackass did great, but is that your brand? If you, right. And to be honest, that came up too, right? We had right. administrators who like, Hey, what if they decide that their brand is a jerk? I'm yeah. like, well, then they have to live with that. I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to tell them they can't be a jerk, but if they break school rules, then they're going to get suspended. Yeah. But, but to answer your first part, like that was part of it, like of the setup. Then towards the end of the class, when they're sharing, I make everybody do it like a tutorial. So whatever they say their passion is, their expertise is in, okay, let's teach that, right? Because part of building a brand is you eventually becoming the expert yourself. And if you can teach something, then in my mind, you're showing me your expertise. So I had a student who made a uh, YouTube video about wakeboarding mm -hmm. and I knew nothing about it. it. I graded it. He turned it in. Perfect. Thank you for doing your work. About a year later, his mom and dad both worked at the school and dad walks in. He's the film teacher 
and he says, hmm. Jason, Jason, do you know what happened to uh, Ethan's skimboarding video? I said, no. And he pulled it up. It had like 100,000 views. Hmm. Now, now, here's the cool part. The first 80 comments, you're a loser. You're a jerk. Right. Who would ever watch your stupid video on wakeboarding? Why don't you put on a T-shirt, you bird chest? Like, it hmm. was bad. And then 81 through 800 was all these people he's never met telling those people, why don't you have some confidence and post a video? Why don't you try doing this? This kid made a video. Right. Maybe it was for school, but at least he did it and he tried. What are you, dude, these strangers came to his rescue. Mm -hmm. And that's what the parent was trying to show me was this one video that my son posted in your class is now the lesson for the class. Right. Like post your passion. Yeah, you might get bullied, but if it's something you really believe in, A, who cares? And B, if it's quality stuff, the world's going to notice it and they're going to come and support you. It was yeah. magic. <laughs> that's, that's an awesome story. I, I've had this conversation and it's, you know, with people that are resistant, they're like, you know, I'm so terrified of like having my kid do this. You know, there's a lot of bad stuff online. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you something, but I don't know if I'm going to make it worse, but I want to be real. So let's say your kid wants to be a YouTuber, okay? And let's say they suck. They're not very good at it. They're posting terrible stuff. They're going to get hate, yeah. right? They're going to get negative comments. People are going to be bashing them. That is a reality, okay? So let's flip it and say they're awesome. They're really good at it. Do you know what? They're also going to get hate. And that's a reality because it's good, but it's going to be from different people, people that are jealous, people that are insecure. Part of what we have to teach our kids is how do they navigate this stuff, right? And, you know, part of it is I really think about my online presence, how I connect with people, how I deal with super negative comments. There's crabby teachers out there who post really ridiculous things. I just ignore them, to be honest with you, because I don't give, I would, if someone started screaming profanities at me, like in public, I would ignore them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be like, oh, tell me more. Like I would, I would, I wouldn't do that. And so I, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for that. And if that's what you're doing with your life, God yeah. bless you. Right. So it is like, how do we deal with this? There's another thing I want to point out or want to share with you. And it was, I remember this very distinctly because I've been talking about this for a long, long time. And I talked about when I was a principal and this is actually when I was a principal that I actually would never interview anybody in a uh, for a job until I Googled them. And if I couldn't find anything on Google, you weren't getting an interview. And it was pretty rare. I wouldn't find anything, it, it, but it was, and I actually don't think it was ever, to be honest with you, because I would find something. It might not just be posted by you. It might be posted by the kid who was really mad on you one day and went to rape my teacher and hammered you, you know? And cause we're more likely to, people are more likely to post negative stuff. Uh, then think, oh, that was great service. I'm going to take time to post on it. They, they, they tend to do this, right? And I remember this one. I actually, I'll say this city. It was Red Deer, Alberta. So if anyone's listening from Red Deer, Alberta, Canada, okay. if anyone was there that day, they remember this. This teacher's like, how dare you say that I'm a bad teacher because you can't find anything on me about Google. I've been teaching so many years and it is so wrong that you do that. And I said, okay, what if you applied for a job and you gave me a resume, but you had no information on it? <laughs> like, well, then I wouldn't hire you. I said, this is your resume now. Yeah, It's just a resume with nothing. And so you don't, you can be mad at me all you want. I'm just telling you reality. I'm not like, this is part of it because if you had a bunch of negative stuff and I hire you, then now I'm going to look bad because the parent's going to, as soon as I say, here's the new teacher we hired, they're all going to Google you, right? If you have nothing, why would I take you over someone who has incredible stuff, right? And by the way, I'm not saying if I can't find you on Google, you're a bad teacher. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you have an empty resume. Yeah. That's what it is. And you would never hire someone that said, here's a blank resume, best of luck. And so that's part of it too. And that, that's what I really thought about when you were telling that story. Part of it is also an inconsistent resume. Like you're right. going to sit down with me in an interview and tell me how great you are and how everybody loves you. But then I do Google you 
and find out what the other side of the story is. Like, I don't want to be right. surprised. I, I want to know not, the truth. Not because it, not, not, not because it's accurate, but like, I, I think that's the, people think that you, I don't necessarily believe because I've had negative comments about me. Right. But there's, I think you want to have uh, I think it was uh, Seth Godin basically said like the, the, we live in candid camera. Now the best thing to do is inundate the internet with good stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's something I really remembered. Uh, I want to just talk about um, your book real quick, Miranda. So tell us like, first of all, who is this book for and what do you actually hope it achieves? So the book I think is for students. However, I would imagine it being used by educators who want to advise students how to manage their digital footprint, how to understand who they are better, how to help people fall in love with them. I, I use that phrase a lot because mm -hmm. I really think that that's part of this. If you're going for a job interview, if you're going on a, a first date, like in your mm -hmm. being interviewed, the goal is to get that thing. And so right. one of the ways to get that thing is you're the most qualified, but my work with Simon Sinek reminds me that lots of our golden circles have those qualifications around them to really stick out. It's, mm. it's the why behind it. And so I think that this is what this book will do at the beginning stages, right? At mm. first it's help you understand who are people, places and moments from your past that made you who you are today. Why were they such an influence? What did they teach you? What did you learn from them? Um, who are you? What do you do now? What do you love? Um, what are your passions? And then what does your future look like? So it, instead of like creating smart goals, although we do that in here too, um, mm -hmm. it's more about like, what's the story of your future? Um, and if you were to meet yourself in the future, what would you find out about yourself? So trying to get it like goal setting in a more creative writing kind of way. Um, but then the book really takes this leap forward to, hey, you look, or now you know who you are. How do we use that to get in front of schools or colleges or job interviews? And when you get that job interview, here's a four sample letters you can send them. When you are going to uh, apply to colleges, here are some college essays that you might want to look at. Right. Um, and so that's my favorite part of the book. And that's actually not the part I contributed was sort of all of the, the pieces that kids could look at and say, hey, I, I don't know how to write a, an application or an essay. Mm -hmm. So this book will sort of give them some insight after they've done some of the pre-work. Um, and because I taught a 13-week class, we didn't get all the way through. This book allowed us to sort of go all the way through to the point of, hey, wait, maybe you don't even want to go to college. If you want to be an entrepreneur, we've got a chapter in there for you there too. Um, right. And that's my focus in the last three years is the entrepreneurship piece. Uh, but in my best case scenario, uh, schools are buying you know, a copy of this for every ninth grader. And there's a teacher who's a visionary in that school mm. who's not afraid to help tell their own story. Because to be honest, those kids aren't going to believe me if I'm not as right. vulnerable as I'm expecting them to be. And that's the hardest piece is finding that teacher at the school who's comfortable enough sharing that story of themselves so that the kids could see sort of the connection for them. But yeah, I'd love to see advisory programs, college advisors, yeah. um, whoever wants to help a kid discover who they are, I think could find benefit here. I, I love that idea because I know a lot of schools all over North America at least do advisory program. And I think this would be so beneficial. And the the shift in thinking for a lot of people is the, the difference between a resume and this, and I think this can be both, is that a resume was often given when you are applying for a job, but this is a space where people can find you, where opportunities start finding you. And I, I'll be very honest that a lot of my career today is because people find this podcast, people find my blog, people find my Instagram, people find my tweets, and they are led to something more that I've done or something that they're interested in and opportunities have found me. And I would love to say that when I first started doing this, that was the goal, but I had no clue nah. that was even a thing. It was accidental. It was totally accidental. And I've been really kind of like, Hey, what if we were in, intentionally helped our students, um, to find, you know, to help, the, help them where opportunities find them in areas of passion, areas of, of things that they're really interested in. 
how would that shift the way that we look? Because you can give a portfolio if you're applying for a job, but best case scenario, people are finding you, right? They're like saying, Hey, we, we got this, we want this place, or maybe you're starting your own business. You're starting something totally different. And I, I think that's, that's why I was like so connected to your work. And so I really appreciate you taking the time out of here. Uh, everyone, if you could check out the book brand up, um, I know Jason will have Jason's Twitter in the, in the description down below as well. He'd love to answer questions about this. So please feel free to reach out to him. Um, Jason, thanks so much, not only for this book, but, um, really being a visionary in what we can do to really help students, you know, cause we talk about students finding their dreams, but I think a lot of times we're pushing them using the same means that we had when we were kids, not seeing there's new doors that are opening for them. And I think you've done a great job opening that for not only the students you work with, but now hopefully students around the world because of this book. Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.